Uh, anyways, I'd like to start about what's going on with the world here. You know, it's, it, this world is coming apart, you know, and if, if, you're, if we're watching like we're commanded, we see this happening pretty quick. I mean, the last two years have been devastating to the United States. It's truly amazing of what poor leadership can do in such a short amount of time. We have the Ukraine war, which is one of the most deceptive wars of all time. We've given them $50 billion already for security assistance, and Congress last year, at the end of the year, approved of giving them another $113 billion, which we don't have. Zelensky says if the war is not successful on their end, that the U.S. sons and daughters, our own children, will be fighting in that war and dying on their soil. He said that. I'm sure the American people, most, most folks, aren't going to let that happen. It's going, to be, it's going to be rough. It could be real rough. They won't agree to send their kids over there to fight and die in that country. In Belgium and the Netherlands, their governments have shut down farms and are forcing farmers to sell their land, all this because of global warming. I don't know if you've seen that. It's not been on the news, but it's been on other areas of the news. Uh, the farmers in protest have lined the streets with tractors for miles. One Dutch farmer says, tonight was the last time we milked our cows. After 90 years, this is it for the organic dairy sector, he says. We aren't allowed to continue because we are labeled a peak polluter. Milking cows, ghastly. How, I mean, how could that be a peak polluter? We have fought this for three years, this guy says. Our government is destroying lives. We have the COVID-19 still in play. And in the hospitals right now, they are packed because of the effects of the vaccine. They won't say this, but my brother-in-law is an MD. He's a pretty sharp guy. And he said that's why, that's why they're packed. There is not a bed available in some of these hospitals. They're out, in the, they're out in, the, in the hallways on some of them in the bigger cities. It's because of the vaccine. And also, on the blue states, they're showing a significant increase in problems because the vaccines have been spiked for blue states and red states. The blue states get sicker. Oh, I'm sorry, the blue states don't get sick. The red states get sicker because they've spiked the, they've spiked the MRN, mRNA shot with more bad stuff in it. So they're showing less deaths in the blue states. If you don't believe me, you can look it up. From these jabs, we see the following. Myocarditis, blood clots, nerve damage, Bell's palsy, tremors, paralysis, immune deficiency, low birth rates, and the list goes on. The government has spent $10 billion on propaganda to try and convince the American public, the businesses, churches as well, that the jab is good, that mass work, that natural immunity is not effective, that distancing and shutting down businesses and schools would slow it down. With the, and that the COVID didn't come from China, which are all lies. We have the lie of the January 6th insurrection that was a setup from this left-wing government. We now have political prisoners in prison. Back in 2017, we went to London for the, uh, England for the feast, it wasn't London, but we went to London first. Uh, for about a week or so. We toured a few areas in, in, in England there. It was pretty interesting. The castle, they, they have history there that we don't have. And we went to the Tower of London. Well, that was built, uh, I want to say it was 1100, or no, 10, 1070 by William the Conqueror. He built that and did a lot of stuff in 1070, England did. But that was actually, half of that was a prison. And it was a prison for political prisoners and they had writings on the wall. It was quite interesting what, what, they, what, what they had to go through and how horrible it was. Being a political prisoner is rough. They let the murderers out, put the political prisoners in. We're kind of doing that right now. So if you question this government on anything, you were labeled a conspiracy nut and you can end up in prison. So much for the freedom of speech and the Constitution. We now have got drag show hours in our military. Also in the schools in a lot of the states of Tennessee has banned this has banned this, and the White House press secretary thought Tennessee was crazy for banning it. It said, that's insane. The crazed left is grooming our children into a woke thought pattern that God hates. It's Satan's world, and it's sicker than ever. A few weeks ago, a woman who thinks she's a man shot three kids and three teachers at a Christian school in Tennessee, and the media says the shooter is the victim because it's a transgender. Tucker Carlson said the other night that transgenderism is the is the worst terrorist group in America right now. They can basically do anything. They've got carte blanche. It's sad. We had a Chinese spy balloon flowing across our country just mocking us, and we wait for the last minute after they finish their job spying on us to shoot it down. I was there, actually. I was out here watching it get shot down in the driveway of my dad's house. And uh, they waited until it clear across the country, and then they blew it out of the sky. It's amazing. 
We have a, a mass, we had a massive, on purpose it seemed, train derailment in Ohio that spilled vinyl chloride, which our brainchild officials set on fire and the toxic gas has killed at least 40 to 50,000 animals, they say, and is doing harm to thousands of people. We are told everything's safe too, nothing to see here, they say. It's all safe, go back in your house, drink the water, everything's fine. It took 21 days for our representatives to check it out. Our fine president, he was in Poland helping Ukraine, setting up pension plans to pay their pensions. That's the world we live in. Now, last week, of course, there was another train, I think it was in Maine, another train went off the rails, leaked more toxic fluid. We have chickens that won't lay eggs because of tainted feed. I don't know if, if the Dixons have heard about that, but a lot of people talk about that. Their chickens aren't laying because they're getting this commercial feed and it, it shuts things down. Bizarre. On the economy side, we have the highest interest, interest rate in 24 years. The inflation rate, they say, is 6.4%, and we all know it's about 50 to 60, maybe 75% if you really do the math. The model of the left and the right is promise everything, deliver nothing, and blame somebody else. And we see that happening. A lot of us here are small business owners, and we see, that the we see the regulations that Mr. Lawrence talked about with his farm, this, this list of stuff that is almost impossible to fill out. He'll have to hire an attorney to fill that out, I, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, I feel for him. I, I pray for him. He's got a nice farm, and they are. It's regulation nation. Uh, you should pray for him. It's going to be difficult to fill out. He's got to do it. He's got to comply. It's like they don't want you to be successful, and they don't. But that's fascism. That is fascism right there. We are led by absolute morons. They couldn't ride a bike and pedal it at the same time. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. If they had to make a living out there on their own, they would starve to death. Turn to Psalm 62, please. Psalm 62. I could go on and on here about the world we live in, but... I wanted to give some perspective of the world around us. You know, we get busy with our lives, get busy making a living. I do. And you, you work 50, 60 hours a week, and sometimes it's exhausting. It's easy to tune out and check out. I believe that's why they want to get the marijuana thing legal. In Tulsa, there's these shops all over the place. They want to keep us stoned so, they can, so we become idiots and they can, they can control us. That's what it is. Easy to control when you don't have a mind. Psalm 62, verse 10 says, Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, don't set your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice I've heard this, that the power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render each one according to his work. Do not trust in oppression. The powers that be in this world want us oppressed with no choice but to conform. They want total control, and it's all about control. It's not about money. Money comes later. It's about control. When, we think of, when I think of control, I think about bullies. Bullies. The whole system is a bully system. What Mr. Lawrence is going through is he's being bullied by an oppressive government. That's what's happening. From weak men, from oppressors, they're weak men. Weak men actually are bullies. But this is a world we live in. So what can we learn from this? Sometimes it seems so overwhelming and some just so plain tiring to deal with all this garbage. It really does. It's frustrating. How do we keep pushing ahead? How can we stay strong? Please turn to Acts 14, please. Acts 14. A lot of the time it's not the world trying to knock us down. It's the trials of life. Maybe a loss of a job. Maybe a loss of someone real close which can be so gut-wrenching and devastating and so darn hard to get back up from. Some fight depression, some fight bitterness, and it can be very difficult to overcome this. root of bitterness just gets so deep and you can't get out of it. How can we stay strong? How do we push ahead? Some fight health issues. Some are just unmotivated to do anything. Some are just plain beat. Acts 14.21 and when they had pre preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystria, Iconium, uh, Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them in, or, or urging and encouraging them and pushing them to continue in the faith, saying, please stay dialed in. Stay dialed in, please. 
We must do many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, we observed the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. And before all this, we examined ourselves. We dug down deep. We took a good look at ourselves. I know that I've found vast improvements that I have to make on my end. I, I know everybody did. I, the, the, like Brian said, it's, it's, you, we need to improve. God re wants us to improve, wants us to get better, wants us to try our best. Please try. Please trust me. That's what the book's about. Trust. Please trust me. I want to help you. I want to help you make it. I called you to help you make it so you can be in God's kingdom, so you can be just like me, so we can be a family together. God's about family. Brethren, if God is really real to us, and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is in charge and watching our every move, and he is in the charge of this earth and everything in the universe, which he and at the time the word, the word who became Christ designed, built through the power of their Holy Spirit, that our reaction, our response to any trial will be different in a lot of cases than it currently is. I speak to myself too, big time. I, I've made more mistakes probably than anybody. I've got a big mouth and make all kinds of mistakes and it gets me in a lot of trouble. But you learn from that stuff and you, you try to grow from it and you try to do better. We never ever want to stagnate, ever. We keep moving, we keep pushing through it. When you go through trials, it's like dealing with a bully. You have to got to face it head on. You can't ignore it. You can't push it aside. You can't wish it away. You can't have someone else do it for you. You're responsible for you. And one advantage we have is we can go directly to our Father and we can ask Him for help. Ask Him for help. That's a big advantage. Back in the beginning of my 10th grade year, 1977, uh, I'm from Southern California originally. Uh, my folks, my dad, and my stepmom at the time, uh, my mom died a few years ago. Step dad and stepmom, without her, I'd be in trouble. Uh, she's been more of a mom to me than I could ever ask for. Good, good, hardworking woman. But we moved to uh, Reno, Nevada in 77, out of the Southern California area. And I, you know, when you go to school in kindergarten, it was in 67, <laughs> all the way through for 10 years, you get to know everybody. You know all your friends and you don't have that stress of trying to make new friends. Well, I had that stress. We moved to Reno in 77, Reno, Nevada, where I met the Nelsons. Good people, good people. And uh, uh, anyways, I, so, I, so I went to Wiltshire High School up there. And uh, boy, I'm telling you what, I, I, I got involved with a guy that I shouldn't have gotten involved with. He seemed like a nice guy. Uh, his name was Frank. And you know, when you're new, you gravitate towards somebody that you gravitate towards somebody that you can talk to that talks to you, and so we were kind of like halfway friends. I thought, you know, a couple of weeks go by. This is all before the feast. It was on a Monday, I remember, and he walks around to the to the back of the back of the uh, of the football field. There's a bunch of bleachers back there, and some guys are there smoking cigarettes. You know, the stoners. You know, and I don't know why I even walked back there. I shouldn't have done it. I'm 15. I wasn't this big tough guy. I was a skinny 15 year old kid. That was a little underdeveloped, if you know what I mean. I hadn't become a man yet, hadn't got my growth spurt yet. I was just, I was a little behind the times so of about 5'8", 120, soaking wet. Uh, anyways, this guy, pretty good sized guy, flipped a cigarette butt and hit me, sits him in the face with it, you know, and I went like that, you know, and I kind of gave him a dirty look. Probably shouldn't have said nothing at all. But on the way back, I told my buddy Frank, well, I'd like to kick that guy's, you know, butt, you know, is what I said. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Uh, learn real quick, learn real quick. About an hour later, after the next class, out in the hallway, he knocked me, he knocked me down pretty hard. Knocked all the books out of my hand. Did that for the solid day, whole day, right? Did that for the whole day. Next day comes around, does the same thing again. Neighbor down the street that I knew pretty well, big guy, looked like he was 30 when he was 15. You get guys like that, big old full beard, play football. He was a varsity when he was a, a sophomore. Big guy, his name was Brian. Brian's down the street, got good guy. I always made friends with those guys, made sure they liked me. Uh, anyway, so he went up there and grabbed a hold of the guy and shoved it up against the locker and said that he was gonna, you know, knock the heck out of him if he touched me again. And uh, all that did, we made it worse. Made it worse. Learned another lesson there. Another lesson. So, after four days of getting kicked around, Hardcore kept around. I went to my dad. Should have done that in the first place. Go to your father.
when you're 15, your dad's like God, right? When you're a kid, you know, your parents, they're, they're like God. So I went to my dad. I said, Dad, I got a problem. I told him what happened. He says, come in the room, son. Come in the room. Shut the door. Got his right fist. Took, he hit me on the left shoulder darn near as hard as it could. Knocked me down on the other side of the bed. Fell over the other side of the bed on the floor. And I got up, kind of wind knocked at me a little bit. Get up. Get up, boy. So I got up and he says, are you all right? I said, yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. There's nobody in that school that could hit harder than me. And you're fine, right? You put your head down and you swing and you don't stop. I did that. Problem solved. Did that one morning and the guy said, I've had enough. You had enough? I said, you better believe I had enough. We walked away, shook hands, and I was never bothered in school again. Not one time. Not one time. Title of my sermon today, always go to God first. Go to your Father first. Always. When we go through trials, we need to go to our Father in Heaven first. Immediately. Don't, go, don't do it by yourself. Don't ask someone to help you get through it. You can always ask your friends, but you go to God first. Ask God to get involved. And that's what I should have done. I learned, I, learned, I learned two lessons on that little escapade that happened to me in 1977. Always go to God first. Always. And secondly, keep your mouth shut unless you're willing to back it up. You know, you, you can't go to the principal. This, this is something that, that happens to boys. It's just the way it is. You never, ever start a fight. I don't recommend beating anybody up. Never. But man, sometimes you have to protect yourself and there's nothing you can do. There is nothing you can do. You go to the principal, makes it worse. Go to the counselor, makes it worse. Trust me, you've got to go full on and you've got to face that bully, whether it's, you know, anything, anything in your life, you know, anything in your life. Like Mr. Lawrence, he's going to have to face that. He will. But anything in your life that gets to you, you've got to face it. You've got to face it. Keep your mouth shut, though, unless you're willing to back it up. That's a big thing, too. Dr. Meredith says that, in, in Dr. Meredith would say this. He say, some people only understand overwhelming force, and that's absolute fact. That's a quote from Dr. Meredith. When you look through the examples of the Bible, which is put here for our benefit, you see some harsh examples of what people went through. You see... You can see the ones who went right to God. They trusted God, and you can see the results that happened from that. And you can see the ones that didn't trust God and the results that happened from that. Turn to Kings, 1 Kings 22, please. 1 Kings 22. We'll see an example of a king that didn't trust God and didn't want to hear the truth, and then a king who did. First Kings 22. 1 Kings 22, verse 1. Now three years passed. Now three years passed without a war between Syria and Israel. And then it came to pass on the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit Ahab, the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth, uh, Ramoth in Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go down with me and help me fight Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire of the Lord, though. We need to go to God first. Please require of the Lord today. Uh, then the king of Israel gathered his prophets together, about 400 men, 400 prophets, and said to them, Shall I go uh, against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there still not a prophet of the Lord here? That, may we, that may, we may inquire of him. So obviously he knew that these guys were fake prophets, fake prophets. First Kings 22, verse 8. So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may, may be, who, who we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate this guy because he does not prophesy, prophesy good concerning me but evil. So Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah the son of Imla quickly. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, having put on their robes, each sat on his throne at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. 
and all the prophets prophesied before him. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chaniah, made horns of, of iron for himself and said, he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Syrians until they're destroyed. Basically lying to the king because he didn't, he didn't get that note, note from God. These guys, weren't, weren't, these guys were fake prophets. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to remote Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the messenger who had gone from Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen to the words of the prophets with one accord. Encourage the king. Please let your word be like one of them, encouraging Micaiah to tell, to tell Micaiah what to say. And Micaiah says, As the Lord lives, where the Lord says to me, I'll speak. Verse 15, he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he answered him, he says, go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. He obviously said this sarcastically. So the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear to me and tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? The verse 17, uh, he said, I saw all, all Israel, Micaiah said, scatter on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have these have no master. Let us return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? That's why he hated him, because he told him the truth. He didn't want to hear the truth. So Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and the hosts of heaven standing by on his right hand and his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up, that he may fall at remote Gilead? So one spoke in this matter, another spoke in that matter, and then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him, a lying spirit. The Lord said to him, In what way? So he said, I'll go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, You shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets and yours, and the Lord has de declared disaster against you. Micaiah said this. Now Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chaniah, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Why did the spirit from, which way did the Spirit from the Lord go from me to you to speak to you? Micaiah said, he said, Indeed, you shall see that day when you go into the inner chamber to hide. So the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him the bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. But Micaiah said, If you ever do come in peace, because you're not going to make it, you're all going to die. And he said to me, he said, take heed all you people. So in verse 29, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to remote Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle. But you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. So, the, 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 you know, Ahab's out there disguised. He's like the regular guy out there thinking he'd get away, but he's kind of a coward. And Jehoshaphat puts all the robe on like a king out there, you know? So he, he's drawing all the fire towards him. That's what, the, what, is, the, the, what Ahab wanted him to do. So now the king of Assyria commanded the 32 captains of his chariots, saying, Fight with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, Surely this is the king of Israel, because he was all dressed up like a king. Therefore they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. And it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at, drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. This happened randomly. God directed this to happen. So he said to the driver of the chariot, Turn around, take me out of the battle, for I'm wounded. Just like Micaiah said would happen. The battle increased that day. The king was propped up in his chariot facing the Assyrians and died at evening, just like what was prophesied. The blood ran out from the wound onto the floor of the chariot. God was not real to Ahab. It was the furthest thing from his mind. The furthest thing. Turn to 2 Chronicles 19, please. Let's see what happens when God is real to you. Some might say, well, this is in the Bible. It really doesn't apply to me. Uh, this was thousands of years ago. And these people are real people, just like you and I. King Solomon says, nothing's changed under the sun. They had the same problems we have. They get allergies. They blow their nose. They get hay fever and get sick with flus and colds and everything else and probably got measles and mumps and all that stuff that we get to. They went through the same thing we go through. They were real people. This happened to them. And we'll all meet them one day. Second Chronicles 19, 19 verse 3. Nevertheless, good things are found in you that you have removed the wooden images talking about Jehoshaphat from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. He prepared his heart to seek God. Jehoshaphat did. 
So Jehoshaphat went to dwell in Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim, and brought them back to the Lord of their fathers. He set judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge man, but for the Lord who is with you in judgment. Now therefore let the fear of the Lord be upon you, and take care to do it, for there is no iniquity for the Lord, no partiality or taking of bribes. Remember how Ahab, he, he, he bribed his fake priest to give him the news that he wanted. That's because he hated the other guy's news, because it was real news. He wanted to hear the truth. He wanted to hear the lies. Moreover in Jerusalem, uh, verse 8, For the judgment of the Lord and for the controversies, Joseph had appointed some of the Levites and priests, and some of the chief fathers of Israel. But when they returned to Jerusalem, and he commanded them, saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a loyal heart. God loves loyalty. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 20, just uh, down the page here, next chapter, verse 1, 20, verse 1. It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazan Tamar, which is in, in Gadi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. He went to God first and proclaimed a fast through all Judah. Everybody had to fast because he wanted answers from God. He trusted God. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek God. And Joseph had stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of heaven? And in your hand is there not power and might? so that no one is able to withstand you. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land, your people Israel, and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it, and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence. For your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and you will save. This is the guy that trusted God. Verse 10, And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you, God. We need your help. We need your help. Now Judah, with all the little ones, their wives, their children, they stood before God. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, a Levite of the sons of As Asaph, Asaph, in the midst of the assembly, and said, Listen, all you sons of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Josephet. Thus the Lord says to you, Do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for this battle is not yours, but it's God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle, but position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of your Lord. Who is with you? Who is with you, O Ju uh, Judah and Jerusalem? Do not uh, fear or, or, or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. This is one of the many awesome events that we can look forward to that shows us that how real God is. He was there. He helped them. He was with them the whole time. Jehoshaphat was stressed. He had the weight of the country on his shoulders. He didn't, try to, he didn't try to do this on his own. He didn't ask someone to get him out of it. He went to God first. He told, he God told him what to do. God made him face his enemy. He said, go out there. Position yourselves. Put your, put your, put your, all your military gear on your, your sword, get it ready to go, and face your enemy, God says. He made him do his part. He made him act. But God says, trust me, I've got this, God says. I've got it. It's my, it's my battle to win. And it happened. Joseph did what he said, and God dialed it in. How do we keep pushing ahead, brethren? How do we, keep, how do, we do this? Make God real to you like Jehoshaphat did. He prepared his heart to seek God. Brethren, time is short, and we, and we know it, we see it, we feel it. Uh, we have to seek God. We, have to, we can't just seek him when times are bad. We, we seek him when times are good. And my dad always said when, when you're self-employed and, and you have lots of work, that that's the time 
to look for work is when you have work, not when you don't have work because you make bad decisions. But now is the time to seek God. When things are pretty good, we're eating. We had Chick-fil-A on the way down here. It took a long time. We were a little bit late. But we got food. We ate. And, you know, things are okay. Sure, there's a lot of bad out there right now. There is. It's rotten. We see it. I read about it in the beginning of the, of, of the sermon here. But times really aren't that bad yet. They will get bad. But seek God now. And you know, my mom had cancer and uh, got diagnosed with colon cancer in, in uh, the summer of 2016. And uh, it was bad news. It was like Mr. Munson's. It's a miracle right there. It's like Mr. Munson's. He had a football-sized tumor like this. She had a softball-sized tumor, like maybe like a grapefruit in her colon. She was 77, 78 years old at the time. No, I'm sorry, 76 at the time. And uh, she was at my house, and she wasn't feeling good. And she went home. It was, I live in Tulsa. Of course, she lives in, in, this, in the uh, L.A. area, Orange County area. And she flew back, and she was sick the whole trip. She had no one to discuss it here, but it wasn't fun. Uh, it didn't feel good. It was very uncomfortable for her. So she went to the doctor, and she was losing blood. And they found out that she had that tumor, and they took out 23 lymph nodes. They took out part of her colon, just like Mr. Munson. It's almost carbon copy. And uh, went through all the chemo and stuff, but I went down to see her. It got more frequent as she got sicker, but I would see her maybe once a month, and it was, then it was like every other week for a while there towards the end. I went down there for the weekend and, and spent time with her, and she died October 30th of 2018 from colon cancer. Uh, it, it, it took her, it was bad news. It was not fun. Uh, it was tough, real tough. Uh, but she, when she was feeling good, she never thought about God whatsoever. She was never in the church, didn't know about God, didn't even want to talk about it. But when she got sick, she asked me to pray every meal. Let's ask God's blessing on the meal, she'd say. When times are bad, she seek God. We can't do that. We seek God when times are good and bad. doesn't matter. Seek God when times are good. Always. So important. If you ever want to fast, fast. When something really good happens, thank God for it. Fast that day. Plan it. Maybe fast that, that Sunday or whatever, whatever day works for you. Fast when times are good, not just on a crisis. Yes, we need to fast on a crisis. Yes, we need to draw clo close to God on a crisis. But when times are good, you draw cl close to God then. That means, that knows, that, then he knows that you really, you're serious, you really mean it. You really do need him. It says in in Deuteronomy 8 that God says when things are good and your barns are full and the houses are you got a nice house and your horse is healthy and strong and or your car is running good or whatever it might be don't forget about me don't forget about me ever don't forget about what you learned don't forget why you you left your former organization and came here because of faith because we were tested because it was difficult we're going to be tried again we'll, we, we will be don't forget don't forget the faith that we had because we didn't want to not obey God by not going to church and not singing, obeying the government rather than the man. We did that. We left because of that. Don't forget it. Right? We'll be tested again. Seek God when times are good. So we have the faith when times get bad. We'll seek him then too. Always seek him. We should never ever leave the house without praying first, ever ever, ever leave your house without getting on your knees and asking God for his help. Help, help me, please. Help me stay dialed in. Don't ever forget to do that. Part of preparing to seek God is networking with him, is getting to know him through prayer, study, and fasting, of course. Please turn to Job, please. Turn to, turn to Job, please. My folks really wanted me to go to Ambassador College when I graduated high school. I graduated in, in uh, 1980, uh, went to a regular college, went to University of Nevada, Reno, and a, and a, a uh, community college about a year before I went to Ambassador College in 81. But I wanted to go, but my grades, they were, they were just average. And school, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't my thing. It just, I'd rather be on the job site working hard, sweat pouring off me, swinging a hammer, or, or I did a lot. My dad was a builder. I, I, did a lot of that stuff, but also I, I painted a lot of his houses. In fact, I did all of them until I went to AC. That's probably why I'm a painter now. 
but uh, I, it, I just took to that real good, and I did a really good job at it, and I, I, I liked it. Everybody else hated it. I loved it. But I got a chance to do everything, and I'd rather work on the job side than go to school. Uh, our pastor, he, didn't, he wasn't thrilled with me either, didn't think I fit the mold. But, uh, but my dad, dad was a networker. He knew all the important people. You know, at the time, he back when we lived in Southern California, Dad uh, was an air conditioning contractor, and he had a pretty good reputation at the church. He talked to all the Dad just liked the network. He just likes the fellowship. He shake everybody's hand. He knew everybody. He did the air conditioning for this TV studios at Ambassador College, so he knew the facilities director. He knew the college architect. He was good friends with the church's attorney, Mr. Helge, at the time, and knew him real well. And uh, he air conditioned Mr. Apartian's house. He was just a networker. And in the world that we live in, it's who you know. So when the application was filled out, uh, I got accepted. That's just the way it is. That's the way it works. I'm not trying to lie here. That's just the way it works. I was immediately accepted because it's who you know. A networker. One reason why God wants you to go to church. That's another reason. Uh, there's many reasons why. We grow iron sharpening iron, but we get to network with one another. We get to know what people do. We get to help each other. Well, you do that, you do that, I do that, I know a guy that does that. I can help you do that. You need a guy here, I, I, I know a guy can help you over here. Another reason why to go to church. And that's way down here. The other one is to grow and, and to get close to God and, and, to, and to help each other do better as a Christian because we encourage each other. But also, it's all the other small things that go along with that. It's just another bonus. Another plus is we get to know each other. We get to help each other in every way. In every way. It makes us more well-rounded. It's, it's, good. it's a good thing. Job 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East, the greatest. And his sons would go feast in their houses, verse 4, each on his appointed day, and they would stand and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job says, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly in the good times and the bad times. A little background on Job, uh, Brian mentioned it a little bit, there's a good article, and I read through the article cover to cover pretty thoroughly, and I believe the article's right. I believe it's right. And Mr. Armstrong referred to it many times, and there's some other, when I, when I researched it even further, there's a couple of Baptist churches that go to Mr. Dr. Hayes' article, and they use that article, and they say Job built the pyramids too. But in Genesis 46, uh, 13, don't need to turn there. It's just real, real quick little background here. Uh, Dr. Hay was saying in his article that he was a king, and he came to the throne in 1726 B.C. He was a master math mathematician, a structural and architectural engineer, a gifted builder. He was the builder of the Great Pyramid, which his uncle Joseph helped him build. He was a grandson of Jacob. The Greeks called Job Cheops. And, of course, you can go into the, uh, the Armstrong Library, and uh, he wrote it's, it's from 1964, uh, The Plain Truth, Who Built the Great Pyramid by Dr. Hay. It's extremely interesting. It's very lengthy. It's very detailed. And uh, you might learn something. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. I was blown away by it. I couldn't believe it. Brian mentioned to me, uh, it's been a year ago probably, about that. We talked about it. I didn't know he was going to say that, and I, we just kind of said the same thing. But uh, it's a pretty, pretty good article. But Job was a powerful man. He was a smart man, a man that feared God. He was an Israelite. He grew up knowing about and believing in God from childhood as he did regular sacrifices. And it shows that he must have really loved his family. He did sacrifices for them too. He was a family guy. Let's read on, Job 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came along with them. Along with them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Notice that God says this about Job. Nobody else. God says this. It was a real deal. 
God knew Job from what, his actions, from what he did. He knew Job. So Satan answered the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for nothing? You have made a hedge around him and, and around his household, around all that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. And you pay him to do this. Of course he's going to like you. You give him everything he's got. Of course he's going to do good for you. But now stretch out your hand and touch what he has, and he'll curse you to your face. Notice, though, that Satan, he couldn't point out one imperfection in the man, one imperfection in his righteousness. Satan couldn't do it. Even God said it was perfect. Yes, Job was a righteous man at that time who had ever lived, the most righteous who had ever lived. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Notice there's no contest here between two equals, of course. God is all-powerful. Satan's got as much power as, as an ant. He'd just be crushed by God right there. Easy, piece of cake. That's the, that's the difference in power between God and Satan. God sits in authority supreme. Satan can't do one thing without permission from God. Not one thing. When we read on, we find that Job, he loses his sons and daughters. Brutal. All his wealth as well in a matter of probably two minutes. Think about that. When you're Job, you're a good guy. You honor God. Even in the good times, you honor God. God knew him. He said he was upright, blameless. He said he feared God. God said there was none like him on earth. None. What would you do? What would you do in that position? Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking tragedy of the worst kind. I can't even imagine. What did Job do? Let's read Job 1, verse 20. Then Job arose, Job arose tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. Job went to God first. He said this. He says, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord taken, has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this, Job did not sin or charge God with any wrong. Job, Cheops, the Greek called him, really was an upright guy who feared God, who respected God. He knew all the wealth he had that God gave it to him. But he also knew that God was responsible for all the disaster as well. He knew that nothing happened contrary to God's purpose, nothing. Job 2 verse 1, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Satan says, Stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and flesh, and surely he'll curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and he struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a, a, a potsherd, a piece of pottery to, which to scrape himself from while he sat in the midst of the ashes. I've had, I remember having chicken pox as a kid. I may have been, I think I was eight or nine, but I remember that. It wasn't painful as these boils, but man, it hurt so bad. It itched so bad I could hardly stand it. I'd scratch it. My mom would grab my hand and say I couldn't do this. She would rub stuff on there and it felt so good because probably like that pottery thing that Job was scraping himself with, it probably the only relief he got. Can you imagine that? Feeling that way and having all those blisters and stuff all over you? It must have been a ghastly sight. His friends, they stood around for seven days looking at him. and they, they couldn't even talk to him. He looked so bad. And he took for himself, okay, I just read that, never mind. His wife said to him, after looking at him, after what he looked like, his wife says in verse eight, verse 9, do you, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die, the wife says. He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we, not, shall we indeed accept good from God? Shall we not accept adversity? In all this, God, Job did not sin with his lips. You know, Mr. Fritz talks about the checklist. And he, I think he mentioned Job as well in the checklist. I really love, I like that analogy, and it fits well here. You know, Job, he was, he was king. He was master mathematician, master structural and architectural engineer, builder of the number one of the seven greatest wonders in the world, the Great Pyramid. He did that. Just a few quick facts. The structure has 2.3 million stones that weigh two to 50 tons each. Think about that. The base covers 592,000 square feet. The temperature inside the pyramid is a constant 68 degrees. Pretty amazing, 68 degrees. Fahrenheit, 
The outer mantle has 144,000 casting stones, all of them highly polished and flat to an accuracy of one one, 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 hundredth, one, one hundredth of an inch. One over a hundred inch, okay? Pretty, that's pretty tight tolerances. I don't know if we could do that today. And they weigh 15 tons each. They have a ball and socket construction. The mortar uh, use is of an unknown origin. However, it's been analyzed and its chemical composition is known, but it can't be reproduced today. It's stronger than the stone itself. How the blocks were transported and assembled into the pyramid is a mystery to this day. We don't know how, the, how they did it. Pretty sharp guy. Mechanical engineer, structural engineer, mathematician. S smart guy. Job was that guy, achiever. He was a driven man. He was a smart man. He did the checklist, and they all checked. I'm sure he thought that. Wouldn't you think that? Man, things are going good. Well, what, what in the world? I, I, I don't understand it. Question is, what kept Job from not listening to his wife? What kept him from not listening to his wife? I thought about this and thought about this. You know, after Mr. Armstrong died, we lost about 90% of the people. That were all called, that tried to do the checklist. They kept the Sabbath, they tithed, they went to church. They didn't eat pork, they kept the holy days. They were at Passover service every year, and they all seemed like they, they got it. Seemed like they got it. What I've learned in my life is this, that just plain going through the motions doesn't cut it. If you think that just believing is enough, well, it says in James that even the demons believe and they shudder. They're frightened to death. In anything you do that you want to be successful at, yes, you have to go through some motions. But with that, you need a network. You have to sell. You have to drive yourself, push yourself, make it happen. You have to perform, never quit. And there's much more. That burning desire, a burning desire of vision, you have to have that to carry you through. Without vision, people perish. In a nutshell, you can say that you go through the motions because you love it, because you love it. I don't think Job just went through the motions. I believe that he loved God, wanted to please God like a son or daughter, loves their parents and wants to please them. There must be something else he was lacking in. Was this fair what happened to Job? No, no. But God sees the big picture. He sees it. He knows what he's doing. Remember that without struggle, there is no strength. Also, adversity causes some men to break and others to break records. Okay? Adversity causes some men to break and others to break records. Turn to Micah 6, please. Micah 6. God loved Job, and he was being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Again, the checklist. Job's list was dialed in. He did it all. I bet he was proud of it. He was the most righteous man to have ever lived. He had fame, fortune, ambition. He knew the right people. He had the know-how. He could sell it. And yet, this is what happened to him. Micah 6, verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the, the, the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Israel, of course, is trying to buy God here. You know, Catholics do this. They do some type of a penance. They, they punish themselves uh, so they can get forgiveness from God. Instead of, uh, like, maybe it's like some, uh, like a, a self-abasement to, so, to show sorrow. Like, well, I'm, I'm going I'm to stop doing this so I can, God will forgive me for that, and I can do that, and this and that, and then I'll go back and do it again. They do that. Th you know, they think they can make up for their sin instead of just plain repenting like God commands. It's real simple. Change. Repent. Change. Go God's way. Verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Three things. Three things. 
but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The first verb in Job states that he was an upright man, blameless, fearing God. However, did Job do the three requirements? Let's turn to Deuteronomy 10, please. I think you could definitely say that Job was a just man. God said that. He did justly. But what does it mean to do justly? What does it mean to do justly? Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and serve the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul and to keep the commandments of God and his statutes, what I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest of heavens belong to, you, to the Lord, also the earth and all that is in it. Turn to Genesis 18, please. Justly means justice or righteousness, as well, you're turning to Genesis, it says in Psalms 119, 172, that my tongue shall speak of your word for all your commandments are righteousness. Genesis 18, verse 19. For I've known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they may keep the way of the Lord to do justice and righteous, uh, to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring Abraham to what he has spoken of him. You know, clearly we see that, that Job did justly as Job 1 says, God says, Job was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. And it takes character to do the right and reject evil. We have to reject evil. Like Brian said, you, Satan doesn't make you do anything. You reject that. He puts that in your mind. You go with it. You make that choice. You need to reject it. Job rejected evil. God said that. We need to do that. Choose the right and reject evil. Job did this when he was in the good times. When he was doing well, not just when the chips are down. He was making sacrifices for his sons and daughters if they did something wrong. He was making money then. He was healthy then. He went to God in the good times. Job honored God. And this is a lesson for us. Always go to God first. Always to go to God in the good times. Not just the bad times, in the good times. When things are good, do it because you want to. Do it because you love God. God is not an oppressor. He wants us to want to live his way. He lives that way. He loves it. It's awesome. God requires us to do justly. Can God say that about us? Are we doing justly? The second requirement in Micah 6 is to love mercy. Was Job a merciful man? Was he a merciful guy? Did he love mercy? What about us? Are we merciful? Do we love mercy? Please turn to Hosea. Sometimes people, I've done it. Maybe I may be the only one. We can be quick to judge. We can be judge, jury, and hangman in like a split second. Thankfully, God's not that way. Remember, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was merciful. We had the death penalty on us. Christ took that. He did it for us. Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Please turn back to Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1. This is the God of the Old Testament who gave up everything and became Jesus Christ, and now is talking about how wicked and corrupt that Judah is in Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1, verse 15. When you spread out your hands, will I hide my eyes from you? Even though you make many prayers, will I not hear? For your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away your evil doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. Plead for the widow. This describes mercy perfectly. Notice, rebuke the oppressor. Satan is our oppressor. Brethren, every one of us, again, would be on death row if it wasn't for the mercy of God and his son who took this all on his shoulders. You know, he sweat drops of blood for us. Do you know the kind of pressure it takes to sweat blood? I'm sure Mr. Dixon might know that. In the gym, you're pulling up something. When we were at the strongman competition, they had a deadlift machine there. It starts out at 600 pounds. 
It's a machine. It's harder than a regular deadlift because it pulls you in a different in a different area, a different direction. So you're you're pulling it. It's, it's I almost think you're using more back than a typical deadlift. It's it looks extremely difficult. They start at 600 pounds. You get you pull it up. You do one rep with it. You put it down, and they lower a, a, a barrel, and it's about 80 pounds, and you got to do another one. Then you drop it down, they lower another one in there. They lower seven of them in there. At the end, it weighs 860 pounds. And you've already done seven reps with all that weight, and you're beat. It takes everything you've got. And there's one guy, I think there was, I think there was three guys that did an eighth rep with that. One was Brian Shaw. Big boy. He had to to, be, to, to make his placement because they take 30 men and they narrow it down to 10. They're actually competing right now. We're going to go see the, the end of it tomorrow. But he had to get that one. And he pulled up that 860. It took everything he had to get that 860 pounds. Now, the man's a strong man. But there's a lot of endurance involved in that, too. His nose bled like a fiend doing that. Now, I didn't see if anything else bled. His chest could have bled. We didn't see it had a shirt on. But I've seen guys' forehead bleed. I've seen their chest bleed, some guys, by doing that. Just think of the pressure that Christ felt when he was praying to his father. Going to his father first praying as hard as he could, right? Everything he had, the pressure, the intense pressure and blood coming out of his pores. He took all of our sins in his shoulders. I think he's the strongest man in the world. I don't know if Brian Shaw could do that. Take all the sins on his shoulders. Think about that for a minute. Sweat and drops of blood, the pressure it took to do that. Be like deadlifting 860 pounds for eight reps. Be pretty rough. Pretty rough. All the weight on his shoulders. Turn to Matthew 9. Turn to Matthew 9, please. Matthew 9, verse 12. They say when your blood pressure is that high, I want to say I read something where it was, it was like 260 or 270 over about 100. When you're at full force like that, that's probably what happened to Christ. It may have been even more. It may have been even more that pressure that he had. I'm sure his eyes were bloodshot, right? I'm sure his nose bled, and he was probably bleeding out of his chest and his head. Tough. Tough. It's a tough man right there. Matthew 9, verse 12. Tough man. I, I think about the time when he went to his father's temple, and he grabbed those whips, Right? He said, you sons of Satan, brood of vipers is what that means, you sons of Satan. Get out of my father's house. And he whipped, took that whip, turned the tables, tables over. That guy was a tough guy. World's strongest man right there, I think. I think. Matthew, where was I at? Matthew 9, verse 12. Then when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Another word for mercy, of course, is loving kindness. Let's go back to Job. Did he love mercy? I got off on a tangent there. Sorry about that. Did Job love mercy? Well, if we go back to Job 1.5, Job would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings for his sons, just in case they sinned. So it's clear he, he loved his family. He showed mercy to his family. He loved them. He did that. I think he was a merciful guy. Let's turn to Job 29. Remember that Job was a master structural engineer, architectural engineer, a very successful and no doubt had hundreds of people working for him. In my experience, to be that successful, he would have had needed to treat his men with respect. I've had lots of men work for me in the past, or now, I still do, but if I had them all in the past, I bet I've had three or four hundred probably, the past 30 years of men. And I have found that when you treat your men with respect and try to help them like their job, they'll do a lot more for you. They'll make you more money. They'll be happier. And you can pay them more money. It's give, give. When an employee is happy, he performs better. You attract more flies with honey than vinegar. Really, and I bet Job was that way. I bet he was that way. You know, the people that I work for, I work for a lot of very wealthy people, and I. 
I have found that they treat their people very well. I've talked to employees of, of my, some of my customers, and they, they, they love working for them because they treat them right. They treat them with respect. Job 29, verse 12. Job's explaining here the kind of person he was. He says, Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper, the blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and I searched out the case that I didn't know. I broke the fangs of the wicked, and I plucked the victim from his teeth. Job did love mercy. I have to say that. I think he did. But you kind of read between the lines here. I think Job was kind of proud of the fact that he was pretty good. I think he was. But remember, God said he was upright and blameless. God said that. One who feared God shuns evil, and there was none like him on earth. So Job was proud of that a little bit, I think. But he did love mercy. Job did. God's third requirement was to walk humbly with your God. What does it mean to walk humbly with God? The best scripture that comes to mind, and we all know this by heart, is Isaiah 66 2. For all these things my hand is made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this will I look. One, on, one, on him who is poor and of a contrite heart, and who trembles at my word. Someone that is teachable, someone that is approachable, someone that is a team player, someone that is not a know-it-all. You ever talk with a know-it-all? Just ask them, they'll know, they know everything. They know everything. Let's look at a couple of scriptures on this real quick. Psalm 34, verse 17. You don't need to turn there. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. God is near to you to have a, that has a broken heart. And save such as have a contrite spirit. Contrite means having a, remor a remorseful and repentant spirit. In Isaiah 56, 57, 15, God says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God loves this. He loves when we're moldable, fashionable, like a, like Mr. Armstrong would say, a, a, a clay structure that God can mold and he can turn into a masterpiece and he can get dialed in perfectly. Please turn to, uh, to Luke 18, please. You know, God is all powerful. He inhabits eternity and it's kind of hard to understand he inhabits eternity because we just inhabit a small portion of time, a small slot of time. God created, of course, time for us. He doesn't need time. He doesn't live in time. So we want God to dwell with us. We need to have a contrite spirit that is teachable, approachable, and not think too highly of ourselves. Remember, God hates self-promotion. He doesn't like it. Luke 18, verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable to, to, uh, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, he says. I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this loser tax collector. That's what he's saying. This guy's a loser. Look at me. I'm best, best that's here. I'm the best guy. I do all this stuff. I'm the coolest guy. This guy's an idiot. Thankfully, I'm not like this guy. How many people have done that? I've seen that happen in my life many times. I'm sure you guys have too. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And a tax, tax collector standing far off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. The tax collector was an example of, a, of an individual that walks humbly with God. This is how we should be. This is how we should be. Turn back to Job 7, please. You know, God hates self-promotion. 
He hates when we brag about ourselves. We're all guilty of it. I've done it. It just happens. You're proud of some things that you do. Job was proud of that. But God hates self-promotion. Let somebody else promote you. Don't promote yourself. Let somebody else do it. Right? God, and that's God doing it. He will, he will make you feel better. Don't make yourself better than you are. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. But Job did a lot of that. But in Job 7, here Job is in agony. Job 7, verse 4. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise that the night may be ended? Long night. For I've had my fill of tossing till dawn. My flesh is caked with worms and dust. That is nasty. My flesh is caked with worms and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. Mm. That hurts even thinking about it, even talking about it, it hurts. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is a breath. Will my eye ever again see good? Boy, that's, that is someone that is down in the dumps, someone that is hurting bad, really bad. Turn to John 15. Why did this happen to Job? Tough deal. John 15, please. Brethren, you know that times, they, they can get so tough, and sometimes they just seem so unbearable. I know Job felt that way, and it seemed that way to him, and he, he was at the end of his rope. I mean, he, it's all he could do. The book of Job wrestles with the age-old question, why do righteous men suffer if God is a God of love and mercy? But God, he sees the big picture. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. God loved Job, and I know God saw some branches that needed pruning. Job needed a tune-up, and God, being a master tuner, dialed him in to make him run better, to make him be better. God wants us all to run good, to be consistent, improving, and bearing fruit. As Mr. Munson said, we should strive for the hundredfold. He's right. We should strive for the best, the best. That's what God wants. Job was a sharp guy, a powerful man on earth. He was blameless, just, wealthy, but he thought too highly of himself. God saw that. Turn to Job 42, please. While turning there in Job 38 to 41, I'm paraphrasing this a little bit. God asked Job some questions. Brian talked about that a little bit. He said, I will question you. And then God asked him a series of detailed questions. He says, he says prepare yourself like a man. Get up, stand up, and be a man. I'm talking to you face to face, God says. Prepare yourself as a man. And he asked some questions that were beyond Job's understanding and it humbled Job, such as, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Can you bind the cluster of the seven stars or loose the belt of Orion? It's pretty hardcore questions that we have no idea how to do that. Job didn't. These were above Job's intellect, above Job's pay grade. This humbled Job, and I'm sure he felt pretty small. Job was probably thought he was about right here. It brought Job down to, maybe down to the floor. Showed Job, showed Job where he was. And in Job 42, verse 1, Job answered the Lord and said this. He says, I know that you, God, can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Job 42, verse 3, you've asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak, God, please let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, Job says, but now my eye sees you. Now Job really knows God. Remember, it's who you know. Job really knows God now. He really knows him. Therefore, Job said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Start with Job 19. 
Job 19. Job went through a living hell. There's no other word I could use. I'm sure we'd all agree with that. Went through a living hell. But through the struggle, he came out stronger. He came out better. God helped dial him in. Remember that adversity breaks some men or women, but others set records. He was now contrite. He was humble. He was teachable. Job 19, verse 25. Job says this, in agony, in agony, he says this, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. Job knew God's plan. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And behold, my eyes shall behold and not another, for my heart yearns within me. Yes, God was real to Job. He was real to Job. And through all this adversity, Job never lost sight of that. Never lost sight of the fact that God was real to him. Job did the checklist. He did it because he loved it. He valued it. I hope that's why we do it. Jocko Willink says, It's real simple. It boils down to how bad do you want it? Jocko says, how bad do you want it? Former Navy SEAL Jocko Wilnick says that. How bad do you want it? Those that really want it, they make it. It's real simple. Those that don't, they don't make it. How bad do you want it? God wants us to make it. He called us. He knows us. He loves us. He knows that we are capable to make it with his help. God wants us to love our calling, to love his way of life. God says, trust me. He says, I have your back. The only way we fail is to quit loving and valuing our calling. The only way we fail. When we go through trials, believe me, God knows what he's doing. He knows what we can handle. He knows what we can't handle. Paul talks about that. Go to God first. Ask him for help. He knows exactly what you can handle, exactly what you can go through. He says, don't quit. He says, stay with it. Don't quit. Please don't quit. I'll help you. I've got this. Jordan Peterson says, when confronted with a storm, don't run away from it because it will chase you. It will last longer, like I did in high school. It will last longer. Don't run from the storm. Jordan Peterson says, run into it full force. And you go right through it. Knock it out. Face the bully head on. Earlier I said, it's, it's who you know, whether it's in, in the business world, or in my case at the time, going to college, or being part of God's family. It's who you know in any endeavor. Do you know God? If you know him, go to God first. Go to your Father first. Well, hope everybody has a great Sabbath day. It's been enjoyable coming up here to speak, even though it, it's, uh, you can't go fast in the south. I think we drove over 50 mile an hour the whole way, but we enjoyed being here and glad we were here. And uh, hope everybody has a great Sabbath, a great week ahead. And uh, don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. Keep rowing to shore, as Mr. Munson says. You're in a boat in the middle of the ocean. You keep rowing to shore. You do not quit. And you pray at the same time. God wants us to, to, to hit it hard. He wants us to make sure that we love it, that we value it. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2023, Church of God Assembly. All rights reserved.